Support for WABE comes from Georgia Cancer Specialists, affiliated with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute, treating patients at 26 locations. You can find additional information on Georgia Cancer Specialists at gacancer.com. The Cancer Answer. From WABE in Atlanta, I'm Lois Reitzes, and this is City Lights. When Atlanta hosted the 1996 Centennial Olympic Games, the event firmly situated our city on the global stage. Later this hour, we'll hear about the Atlanta History Center's exhibition Atlanta 96, Shaping an Olympic and Paralympic City. First, Spivey Hall takes us on the road with a band. Special things are the norm at Spivey Hall, from the moment you enter its exquisite decor and experience the superb acoustics of intimate performances by the world's leading musicians. Now you can enjoy special events from Spivey in a virtual format. Sam Dixon is the executive director. He joins us now via Zoom. Sam, welcome back to City Lights. Thank you so much, Lois. Delighted to speak with you. There are two exciting events coming up in November. What will Spivey offer on November 20th? November 20th is an important day for Spivey Hall because it's the first event that we're offering as our series of virtual events in this season since the pandemic hit. And unusually, it's not strictly a performance. It's a documentary film about a marvelous string quartet. The film is called Strings Attached on the road with the Dover Quartet. The very beginning of this film debunks any elitism associated with classical music performance. Without genre bashing, the story feels so timely in the way it breaks through barriers. Would you talk about why this film should be viewed by people, and particularly young people, who maybe aren't familiar with classical music or have some preconceived notions about it. I think the film, which is directed by Bruce Boder, is an amazing testament to the fact that musicians have to create their professional lives. And there's no single way to do this. And whether you're, you know, no matter what genre of music in which you're trying to make a career as a musician, you have to find your own way. And this is a really beautiful and extremely well-produced experience of watching these four incredibly talented musicians create their careers together. They met as students at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia They could have each have had a solo career, but they instead decided to form this group called the Dover Quartet. I don't think we had any idea what we were really getting ourselves into. I didn't really think about anything else that went into it, except for the fact that I'd get to play some of the greatest repertoire ever written and my favorite instrument. And that just seemed perfect. So when I went to Curtis, my goal was find three like-minded musical quartet soulmates and then I settled for these guys. <laughs> Just kidding. I found them. I also think that so many people feel that when musicians, particularly classical musicians, reach the big time when they're known as international stars, that it was effortless, that it was just talent. It was just, you know, their magnificence that that made them get there. 
this film demonstrates the work that is necessary to create a career and how the relationships of the group matter and how each individual musician contributes so uniquely to the dynamics of the group. The film really does an extraordinary job of delving into the lives of each of the individual musicians, two of them, Brian and Joel, the violinists, met when they were little boys at string camp, playing little violins. And the violist, the only woman in the group, Milena, is quite a character herself. She's very expressive, not only while she's playing, but in real life. And she sort of takes on the role of spokesperson for them. And then there's this very reflective, marvelous cellist who brings his quiet temperament to the group. I feel like we get to know each of them as people, and by the end, we're just cheering for the ensemble. Sam, what does this film reveal about your end? of the music world. You bring in these superb ensembles to perform, and as concert goers, we just revel in the beauty of their performance. What does it show that they must do to get on your radar? Well, the Dover Quartet reached my attention very quickly. There's a session of the film where they are seen winning an incredibly important string quartet competition at the Banff Center. Any great string quartet, what happens as a group is better than them individually. So that by being together, Joel is better and Brian is better. Cam is better, Melina is better. They have this ability to empower each other to be able to play at their best. skyrocketed them to fame, there was a tremendous buzz. I'm always interested in listening to musicians and what I listened to when I was first given a recording of the Dover Quartet just wowed me. And then I realized that they were working with musicians I really, really liked. In fact, the Dover Quartet made its debut at Spivey Hall in November 2018 with the pianist Dinan Barnaton and they played the Brahms Piano Quintet in F minor. The audience was rapturous afterwards. We had one of the strongest first impressions of, of a string quartet uh, that I can remember in some 15 years of being at Spivey Hall. And then they came back to us. I generally don't re-engage a quartet in consecutive seasons, but the impact and the musical rewards were both so great that they came back uh, the following season with the Escher Quartet. And each quartet played by itself uh, to open our 2019-2020 season. But then they combined forces to perform the Mendelssohn Octet. And that was one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life at Spivey Hall. So, I mean, they came on fully charged. They came on full blown. And yet there was this tremendous humanity to their playing. And that's something I love. There was energy. It was alert. It had life. It had purpose. They were as one. But the individual personalities of the musicians 
shown through in the most wonderfully expressive ways. They are not about themselves. They are serious musicians. They are about music making. And that's what I need as a listener. And that's what I need as a presenter. If I can't get excited about it, how can I get others excited about it? So we've had two extraordinary experiences with the Dover Quartet. And the film just offered me so many points of connection with people I know in the music industry and particularly in the world of chamber music. So that had a, a particular fascination for me when it was first offered. What you were describing about their individual playing reminded me of a line from the film about how they are better together than individually. It reminded me of when Scotland was trying to achieve independence a few years ago, and in the UK you saw those banners for better together. I'm not trying to get political here, but it says something about what makes ensemble performance extraordinary, because each of these players could have outstanding concert careers on their own. Absolutely true. Uh, and I think we might be referring to the same line. Barry Schiffman, who was a co-founder of the St. Lawrence String Quartet, who runs the Banff International uh, Quartet String Quartet competition, which Dover swept in, in its 11th uh, offering, he stated that they were empowering each other to play at their best. And that is a very potent statement to me because there's more than synergy. There's this sort of nuclear reaction when they really get into each other and they are so attuned to each other. I think that over time, one comes to appreciate everybody as an individual. If there's someone you've known for a year or so or 15 years or so, you really come to know them in time. But Camden, the cellist, made a really important observation towards the end of the film. Um, the amount of emotional history we have is tremendous. And Lois, I'd be curious to hear about your reaction of this very important scene in the film when a rehearsal stops being about music and it starts talking very seriously about how the musicians are feeling. It had my stomach in knots because it shows that their lives are so inextricably linked through the music, through mm -hmm. their individual personalities. And that emotion that goes into the playing could be their undoing once the rehearsal is over if they don't love the music and the music making more than they are concerned about their individual quirks. Yes, Brian Lee, the second violinist, had that revelation uh, following another development in the film in the in the life of the of the quartet. When when that really important scene when they were talking so frankly and 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 sorting things out about the dynamics of the group. Uh, I had this tremendous surge of, my thought was, emotional honesty. They had to come clean with each other about exactly how they were feeling about each other as individuals in the process of being this high-performing, internationally acclaimed, rocketed to success string quartet. And it, obviously there were tensions. And uh, if you've ever been on the road with musicians for a long time, and I've done numerous tours with orchestras, both in the US and overseas, you know, and, and, I, and I, I think it was Camden who said something, you know, people get tired, so they get sensitive, myself included. You know, it's part of the job. Well, we, we reached them at a low moment there, and they were incredibly courageous to let that be filmed. I wondered at that point, how candid? I mean, this is the plight of the documentarian it is artificial to have someone with a camera recording every moment of what you're doing. And do you feel like they were unaware of the fact that this was being filmed or might be used? Uh, no, I think they were very aware of the camera. 
it's hard to avoid being aware of the camera. At the same time, as you know, string quartet musicians spend endless hours talking about the tiniest details of the music they're preparing to perform. And most of them operate in, in to some degree on a consensus basis. There has to be a decision reached and it requires the input of, of the four players, sometimes in different measures. But ultimately there has to be a choice made. So I know that they're very experienced in talking about extremely refined points of view. But I think the temperature of what they probably said was toned down because uh, the, the, the camera was on. That's my guess. And one of the things that I'm happy about in Spivey Hall's presentation of this film is that when, when we first present it on November 20th, immediately after the screening, we get a chance to have a talk with the filmmaker, Bruce Broder, and the cellist, Camden Shaw. And that's when people can ask questions like this. It's like, what was it really like when you were filming that moment? And did you tell Bruce to turn off the camera and he refused? Or, you know, did you, you know, th those are the sort of things we can learn from having these people in our midst virtually. And it's one of the wonderful things about having a virtual event is that you can sort of go back and go behind the scenes and talk with the people who made oh, it. Oh, that, that will be fantastic for, viewers and visitors of this virtual event. Bruce spent more than a year filming this. And Bruce knew Milena because Bruce's son got involved in music and Bruce's son was about Milena's age. So he's known Milena and her family for a while. And you know, Milena is an amazing person, I agree. She sparkles on stage. She's a beautiful presence in the film. And she has very, very interesting ways of of expressing herself and she, she makes some interesting statements. I was really taken by how the musicians describe how each other is as a musician. You know, that's very telling. When I'm interviewing people for Spivey Hall, we ask people, you know, what would your colleagues think is, is, is your personality and work style? And that tells a lot about the person you're talking to in addition to someone else. But in this case, I felt that the musicians were very open with us. We saw Camden that has recently purchased, you know, country home where he needed to escape after 263 days on the road or whatever it was. It was a long, long time. We saw Joel teaching, uh, coaching a, a a string quartet at Northwestern University. That was his way of getting his head and heart into a different space. And teaching can renew people in, in really important ways. I've seen that time and again in my work at the Music Academy of the West when all these wonderful musicians who are faculty are also giving master classes every week. It just lifts everybody's lives. So we see Brian contending with the fact that someone he used to date and was in a relationship with almost two and a half years, Milena, has found a new love. And what does that mean for Brian as an individual? How does it affect the dynamics of when the group is together? And the discussion about what happens when they first rehearse after Brian and Milena have broken up is another scene that's worth watching because it could have gone any way. And back to your original question, Lois, these are the trials and tribulations of creative people in professional lives at a high level, producing extraordinarily good music, but also having to be human beings, having to be real to each other, and again, having to embrace what is true to them. Truth is so important in music and truth in classical music and this emo emotional honesty that to me is the pervasive dimension of this film that I like so much, that Bruce reveals so well, is, is heartening to me. I feel like we've had a real reckoning with how music is made and what it means to these musicians and how it can inspire us. Because throughout this pandemic, the power of music and its ability to inspire us has not been diminished. I think that's a reminder that's really important. And this film, as our first virtual event, I hope will drive that message home. For I completely agree, Sam. The story feels so timely in the way it breaks through barriers. Again, debunking any elitism associated with classical music performance and also just how of the moment 
these young musicians are the wonderful mandolin virtuoso Avi Avital says of them, this is a newer generation of musicians. He's not so old himself, but he's talking about what I think someone earlier referred to them as not exactly a head banging, but there's a very contemporary edge to their approach to music. And I think that's why this movie would be so great for a wide audience to see. I agree. Avi makes the point. Avi, who's immensely popular, he collaborates with so many wonderful musicians. He was supposed to be at Spivey Hall, but then his accordionist was going to have a baby. So we had to postpone his debut, which was sad. But Avi made the point that musicians of the Dover Quartet's generation have a universe of music available to them at the click of a mouse. They can listen to anything. It's all available to everyone on the internet now. And therefore, they come with a different musical, emotional history. They have different ideas. They're open to collaborations and to the influences of different music styles, music traditions that I don't think would have been the same even 30 years ago. So that is an important point. I also think that it's important to note that musicians take inspiration from the work that they do themselves. And when there was a moment when Brian was really down and he was questioning whether he should continue and he he was obviously struggling and yet he he got down to work uh, Melina called him the most stoic of the players he just sort of stands and delivers and it's all in the sound but he got down to learning this new quartet that the quartet hadn't performed at least recently and uh he was inspired by the emotion within it and he decided that the love of playing was always going to be greater than the love of other things in his life, and therefore he had to stay with it. So this is a lesson. It's a self-discovery film in, in so many ways. Sam Dixon is the executive and artistic director for Spivey Hall. We'll be back with more of our conversation about Spivey's virtual season after a short break, you're tuned to WABE Atlanta. This is City Lights on WABE. I'm Lois Reitzes. Thank you for listening. Let's get back to my conversation with Sam Dixon, the executive and artistic director of Spivey Hall. Their new virtual season begins Friday with the streaming of a new documentary, Strings Attached, follows the young musicians of the internationally acclaimed Dover Quartet. One other moment I found very touching featured the Dovers in an ambassadorial mode when they performed in Salzburg, Mozart's birthplace and the home of the Salzburg Mozarteum, this storied 19th century hall, they played an arrangement of a piece by Duke Ellington in a sentimental mood. And it was remarkable to me when the presenter said, this was the first time music of Duke Ellington was ever performed in the Mozart tale.
that's a big first. And 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 here's here's another aspect of watching a film. Lois, the, the images are up there. We all see them in our own ways. And I, I was very taken by the point that you just made, that, that Lauren Hoffmuster made. But I also observed two other things <laughs> that, you know, just randomly. In the scene, either before or after it, Milena is sitting with her fellow musicians around the table and says, well, presenters like us, particularly in Europe, to play music of our own countries. And, you know, that's why the Duke Ellington makes good sense as an encore here for Salzburg. And at this point, they were really tired. <laughs> they had flown from the US to Austria. They were obviously tired. And the, the expression on the other players' faces was, okay. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't exultation. It wasn't, oh yeah, it was like, yeah. And, and like, can we get some sleep now? And then another thing as a presenter that drove me crazy, I'm sorry, but we see in the film, the Duke Ellington piece being performed by the Dover Quartet. And what are people in the first two rows doing? They have their cell phones on and they're recording it. And that drives me berserk. <laughs> so, I mean, everybody will respond to different scenes in this film differently. That's what film gives us a chance to do. That's like, art lets us do that. It's there, but what we take away from it is a reflection of what we're seeking in it and seeing in it. And it's an expression of ourselves, our reaction, as much as it is the film itself. Well, as if this event weren't special enough, two days later, Spivey will present Stephen Huff. Tell us a little bit about that. We spoke with Stephen, but I'm eager to hear your take on what this means for Spivey Hall. Stephen is a favorite at Spivey Hall, and uh, he's often in Atlanta with the Atlanta Symphony. I've known him at least 20 years, if not longer, 25 years maybe now. Stephen, of course, is the first classical musician who, who was awarded the MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, and his music making is fantastic. And when the pandemic hit, and I had to summarily just swipe all of our programming for the current season off the boards and start over again, one of the things that was early offered to me was the fact that Stephen had this recording that he had made early in the pandemic, and would we be interested in streaming it? And the answer was yes, because Stephen uh, is, is a remarkable musician. This is a wonderful, wonderful film. He, he filmed it in Henry Wood Hall in London. And it's an interesting performance because he's in a hall that is full of natural sunlight. And that is so unusual for a concert experience like this. And, and yet it's so welcome because when we're alone and we're feeling under, under siege in lockdown conditions, to have a brilliant musician playing splendidly in natural sunlight, I thought this is a tonic, this is good for us. And, and the thing is, Stephen sits at this piano and it, again, it seems effortless, it seems natural, it seems inevitable. Nothing is wanting. It is so cogent, it is so lucid, it is so engaging. And at the same time, you have to remember the time and the work, the thought, the heart, the soul that goes into it. And to have someone like Stephen Huff in our lives, even virtually, particularly virtually, <laughs> at this moment is really, really a precious one. We get this emotional world from Stephen, and it's straight through. There's no talk, there's no, and now we're gonna have, no, he wanted it to essentially be a continuous experience. He didn't need or want a talk between it. And I honor that because we can all take away from music what we want, and the music's eloquence speaks for itself in the hands of someone like Stephen Love. Sam Dixon is the executive and artistic director of Spivey Hall. Their virtual season begins Friday with streaming the documentary Strings Attached on the road with the Dover Quartet. More information will appear on our website at wabe.org slash City Lights. You are listening to WABE Atlanta. On September 18, 1990, 
Atlanta was selected to host the 1996 Centennial Olympic Games, an event that many view as a turning point in the city's trajectory. To mark the 30th anniversary of that moment, the Atlanta History Center opened the exhibition Atlanta 96, shaping an Olympic and Paralympic city. Ahead of the opening in September, I spoke with the curator, Sarah Dilla. Here, she talks about what distinguishes this exhibition from that of previous shows at the center. The Atlanta History Center has had a long history of being involved with the city's Olympic history. It actually stems from the fact that the organizing committee of the Olympic Games selected Atlanta History Center as the repository for all of their collections, all the records and objects left over and videos and photos from the process of bidding for and preparing for and hosting the games. The institution has this vast treasure trove of all kinds of things that tell the story of, of a city's time in the spotlight. And, and as you mentioned, that was all used in, in the past exhibition. And now here we are 30 years after the city won the bid, and we're looking back a little bit differently than before. This exhibition opened on the 30th anniversary of the city's selection for the ho to be host of the 1996 Centennial Olympic Games. Um, so that's an anniversary we kind of wanted to mark, and it's also a jumping-off point for us to do something something different with this exhibition. And how it's different is really that that this exhibition is a departure from your traditional sports history in a museum setting. You might think of a sports hall of fame, and, and this is not a sports hall of fame. We want to kind of look at the Olympics as this inherently urban project and how the Olympics really change a city and, and garner attention and create all kinds of ripple effects of actions and reactions of people leveraging that spotlight and the resources and the massive change that comes from uh, the Olympics coming to a city. We hope that this exhibition will encourage people to really think about why Atlanta is the way it is, as well as kind of pulling back the curtain of how a city puts on such a massive event and the changes that it creates. When that announcement that Atlanta won the bid for the games was made, I had lived here over a decade, and yet I did not realize how much impact that made on Native Atlantans, on people who had lived here much longer than I. The, the pride was palpable. I remembered exactly where I was when the announcement came. I was in the lobby of our radio and television station, and some of my colleagues were watching our television. And when the announcement came on, they burst into tears. You know, the, the pride was amazing. And of course, when Maynard Jackson accepted in French, if you will, it was all the more glorious. So it was very special to be part of that moment, but also a window into how much meaning it had for people who were born or grew up here. Yes, I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, your personal story, remembering it. And I think that rings true for, for so many people that we've talked to in the course of, of planning this exhibition. And also, you know, of course, the community that's still in Atlanta who was involved in different aspects of the games. It is absolutely a golden moment and a very nostalgic moment in, in people's memories and in the city's history. 
The exhibition includes touchless interactive experiences. How will museum goers interact without touch? <laughs> that is part of our new normal. Um, I think, you know, the museum industry, just like everyone else right now has been deeply affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this exhibition was actually well underway of development when, with the onset of, of the pandemic. And so we had to really step back and reassess and really think about what museums were going to be like once we were able to reopen again. With the opening of this exhibition, we had planned a variety of interactives throughout the space that were, you know, your traditional touch screens to play videos from the time, footage from the games, oral histories, and that kind of thing, as well as tangible activities to kind of help learning intergenerationally. And so we are experimenting with a new technology that allows you to use touch screen selections without your fingers. So you hold up your hand in front and your, your gestures are captured and they uh, become the kind of the mouse click or the, the finger click. Oh, that's fascinating. It feels kind of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, the 1990s were a big moment for uh, technological innovation. So I hope we're kind of, we're, we're following the trends there. The 1996 games were actually the very first to have a, an official website. So we're, oh. we're continuing with the technological innovations, hopefully. Now there are four themes in the exhibition. Envisioning, campaigning, realizing, and reflecting. I'd appreciate if you could take us through each one, Sarah. Envisioning highlights 11 leaders who were involved in making the games a reality for Atlanta. How far back did that effort go? Talking about these four themes and how the exhibition is structured, this is, is really the, the groundwork for making this exhibition kind of encourage people to think about why Atlanta is the way it is and how the games fit into its long trajectory of, of kind of pushing for increasing status, national status, international status. So that's kind of how we got to these themes. We want to kind of break this story down into the steps of a project and kind of open up the actual process of this massive civic undertaking of the Olympic Games. And so we start with this idea of, of having an idea, of having a vision, and look both at the roots of the 1996 Olympic and Paralympic Games and, and the, the pitch, the starting point of the pitch to have those, as well as all the other kinds of actions and activities that were bubbling up around the city in the late 20th century and and who who were the big actors and who were the people kind of pushing for change or pushing for big new efforts in Atlanta. It highlights a variety of, of Atlanta residents who are doing that work across the board, whether that's developers trying to assess what the downtown will be like in the era of a burgeoning convention industry, or whether that's folks who want to start a coalition of bringing the games to Atlanta, or whether that's a disability rights movement that ends up funneling into efforts to make the Paralympic Games have more parity in Atlanta. So there are all these kind of initial ideas that we wanted to ground people with from the beginning of this story to show a bit more behind this story that's often just thought of as a sports history. The leaders whom you highlight are not just politicians, but also artists, athletes, and disability rights advocates. What determined the 11 you chose? 11 is, is certainly not a comprehensive list by any means. And, and when we work on an exhibit like this, it's at its base an editing process, right? And just like a book or an article, 
we have only a small amount of space to tell a really impressive large story of all the people and what they were doing in Atlanta in the 20th century, late 20th century. We selected 11 to kind of capture the different facets that we wanted to make sure came across throughout this story. And they are certainly not all, all politicians. You know, the, the push to have the Olympics was, was something that was very much led by Atlanta's city leadership and business community. As the story goes in Atlanta, you know, everyone who, who knows that story, who, who remembers being part of the where they were when the bid announcement knows the role of Billy Payne and Andy Young in, in generating the pitch and the excitement around the possibility of getting the games. But there's so much other activity happening at that time that all kind of converges in the 1990s. Uh, and we wanted to use these individuals to kind of put faces to those, those initiatives. Campaigning is the next theme in the exhibition, which focuses on garnering support for the games. Do you present both the excitement for the games coming to Atlanta as well as the stories of those who opposed it? In, in this section, we really wanted to capture both the story of the bid which is, which is a large story in itself, and also the sense of what was happening in the run-up to the games, the impending deadline, the ripple effects almost of, of the announcement that the games are in fact coming to Atlanta, and, and how do different people want to get in on that? Uh, how do they want to to leverage some of that spotlight and some of the resources, or how are they acting at odds with it? It's all kinds of, of motion at that time. We start off with the story of the pitch, the story of the bid, and how, how the presentation of, of bringing the games to Atlanta was, was created and how they gained support for that presentation. And Atlanta had this very elaborate five volume bid book, it's called in, in the Olympic world, which is, which is basically your application to be a host city. And we have a, uh, a mock-up of this book because this is in the age of creating a book before, uh, before your desktop publishing. So it's all kind of clippings and taped and colored pencils of, of what the book layout should appear as. And once the games are secured, we also wanted to look at all of the different initiatives to, uh, to grab hold of that excitement and to help shape what Atlanta was going to be to the world once the games were here. And that took the form of people pushing for social and legislative change, whether it's the Olympics out of Cobb movement, which was run by uh, the LGBTQ community in an effort to change discriminatory legislation in Cobb County and not have the Olympics kind of have a presence in Cobb County until that was changed. And it takes the shape of the individuals who are pushing to uh, host the Paralympic Games, which is that was not secured until a bit after the Olympic bid was won. Today, in today's games, they're both secured together, but that's kind of a change that was made. Continuing through the exhibition, the theme realizing presents visitors with the unfolding of the games. Would you tell us some of your favorite moments from this part of the exhibition? In this section of the games, it is the physical preparation. There's so much activity going along in the preparation of the games, but uh, one of the most recognizable parts of games preparation is venue construction and jobs uh, and the bustle around that. And, and of course, the work of the athletes and the role of the athletes. So in this section, we really wanted to locate the games preparation and bring it into the summer of 1996. Uh, we go through stories of uh, the public art that was created, the venues that were constructed and sites that were constructed. We talk about the park and the stadium in Summer Hill, uh, which was Centennial Olympic Stadium, 
and tell the story of, of those major sites of urban transformation and urban renewal efforts around Olympic-related construction. And so those are interesting stories because they, they harken back to our effort to put this story in the longer context of the city and the longer push for change. Any memorabilia in this show not previously on display at the History Center? We have things from your most memorable athletes from the 1996 games, whether that's the fastest man alive, Michael Johnson, um, or the video of, of Carrie Strug. Uh, we have these moments that capture that, the kind of golden memories of the games, but also the way that athletes um, kind of bring social and political issues to, to a broader audience through, through their performances. Do you include the Cultural Olympiad in this show? Yes, that is uh, one of our, our facets is cultural change in the city. And, and from the beginning, we kind of start the thread of how arts leaders and artists have shaped the city and, and the different forms that that took in the 80s and 90s. The Olympics also brought a large investment to the arts and culture world of Atlanta, whether that's through public art or kind of seed money for projects at our city's cultural institutions, both small artist organizations and the large museums that we recognize today. There were a variety of exhibitions and performances through the Olympic Arts Festival, and there was also the very first cultural Paralympiad that happened at that time. We interweave the story of arts and culture investment um, because that's a major part of, of shaping the city, right? As the, the Olympics come, city leaders and Olympic organizers want the city to project well for, for a global audience. Uh, and that includes a rich cultural scene. One of my favorite objects that we have in the exhibit is actually a model of the 1996 cauldron. It's a very delicate artist model made out of balsa wood and toothpicks, but it was, it was one of the commissions that the cultural organizers on the Olympic teams that they organized. So it's a commissioned work and that's a very rare occurrence for a, for a cauldron. Olympic cauldrons are typically designed by architects or, or engineers to make sure they're um, functional and that they'll hold that flame for the duration. Oh, and of course the unforgettable moment with Muhammad Ali. That is true. That is another one of those, the bullet points of what happened in the 1996 games. Muhammad Ali uh, is unforgettable. And it's, a, it's an example of, of how the role of an athlete carries so much more meaning than just the sport they play. Muhammad Ali's connection to Atlanta and the story of his comeback and how this lighting of the cauldron really really brought his story full circle is, is an interesting component. Indeed. Some people have described Atlanta as a regional capital before the games and an international city after the Olympics. I know that was certainly in the hopes of those who organized the games. Do you think this singular event gets too much credit for transforming the city into what it is today? Well, Lois, I might be a little biased, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the I think the 1996 games were huge. They were certainly huge for the story of recent Atlanta. But I think, and part of what this, this exhibit looks to, and what I hope people will be encouraged to think about, is, is that this event fits into the recurring types of things that, that Atlanta's leaders were doing over, over a long century or more of the city's history. That trajectory shows that constant progression of making Atlanta 
have increasing status nationally and then increasing status internationally. It led up to the games in, in a sensible progression. I hope that visitors will think about that aspect of, of the Olympics, which is really what the foundation of this exhibit seeks to do is, is put the games in this setting where people can understand them as the massive civic undertaking that they were, and yet another step in Atlanta's quest for that increasing image, that increasing status, that name recognition. Sarah Dilla curated the exhibition Atlanta 96, Shaping an Olympic and Paralympic City. It's on view now at the Atlanta History Center. And speaking of the Olympics, it was announced this week that the Tokyo Olympics will take place in July and August of 2021. They had been postponed in March due to the coronavirus pandemic. You've been listening to City Light our daily celebration of Atlanta arts and culture. Tomorrow at 11 a.m. we'll hear about the High Museum's new exhibition of photography, a retrospective of works by Dawood Bey. Also, playwright Alfred Yuri and author Ralph Eubanks We'll talk about the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame. City Lights producers are Summer Evans and Ryan McFadden. Kevin Rinker is our engineer. And I'm Lois Brightsis. I would love it if you'd follow me on Twitter at L-O-I-S-R-E-I-T-Z-E-S. Thanks for listening to 90.1 WABE, Atlanta's choice for NPR.